I feel like there comes a time in every plant parent's life where we start to get real curious about how feasible it would be to either install a greenhouse on our property or set up some sort of grow tent in our homes. Growing under glass or plastic on a larger scale than a terrarium has become wildly popular after the IKEA grow house trend and the surge in popularity of houseplants and gardening in the last couple of years, because I think many of us just hit that moment where we realize Damn, I have too many plants, and I want a dedicated place to keep them all. If you're an outdoor gardener, the promise of a greenhouse for seed starts and overwintering plants is even more promising. I personally have had several different moments in life where I've been Googling greenhouse kits of all sorts of sizes and functions, from a little grow tent for my office that I was fixated on for a while to installing a full glass greenhouse in our last home. I then was able to start my seedlings in Melody's greenhouse, which was a greenhouse glass kit that she had on her property. But I never crossed the finish line on my own greenhouse setup because, gosh, this is overwhelming and somewhat intimidating to install, to not only invest in a greenhouse, but then successfully install it and not fall prey to the issues that people have that when they install greenhouses but don't know what they're doing. Plant friends, today I have put together an episode that hopefully will set you up for success if you feel like you are ready to take the leap of installing a greenhouse, whether it's a small kit in your home or a large structure in your backyard. Consider this episode a beginner's guide to building the greenhouse of your dreams. Welcome back, plant friends. Blue Mangro Radio. Plant friends, I'm so excited for this episode. Oh my gosh, it's so informative and unique for Bloom and Grow. It's two parts. And I just needed to give a shout out to my muses for this episode, two members of the Bloom and Grow Garden Society. Dina is a Garden Society member who attends almost every Garden Society lecture and meeting live from her greenhouse in her backyard in Texas. It is a dream to see the greenhouse that she's created. And we were on a call one day with other Garden Society members. Tony, who suggested after hearing Dina's story, Tony wanted to install her own greenhouse. We had this whole conversation about it, and Tony suggested that this might be a great podcast topic. So thank you to Dina and Tony for your inspiration for this episode. I think it came out better than any three of us could have ever imagined. And plant friends, this is yet another reason to join the Bloom Grow Garden Society. The Garden Society members are family, and I take their inquiries and and struggles and curiosities super seriously. Their conversations that happen in the Garden Society are inspirations for lots of episodes, and there's just always something fun going on. This month, I gave away a whole bunch of advanced copies of Growing Joy, my new book, to members of the Society, and no one can get access to that except the Society members, and they're going to be involved in a bunch of cool launch things around the book. If you don't know, the Bloom and Grow Garden Society is my virtual online garden society and platform for members in our listener community who want college-level plant care education, personal coaching on your gardens and houseplant setups, and a community of plant friends that want to nerd out with plants as much as you do. You can click the link in the show notes to learn more. But honestly, this topic of greenhouses is a great companion to the Garden Society because Leslie Halleck did a three-hour lecture on transpiration humidity and how to manage it with a greenhouse that's a huge topic. Grow lighting also is a huge topic. She has a huge lecture in the Garden Society. So if this episode gets you interested and you want to install a greenhouse, I can't recommend enough. There's so much amazing education in the Garden Society for you to consume. It's like Netflix for plants. And as we're walking into the growing season, set yourself up for success by getting to access Leslie, our horticulturist in residence, on a monthly basis to ask her questions about your garden design, your garden problems, or your houseplant problems. But I'll stop talking about the society. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. Back to greenhouses. Oh my God. Okay, this episode is so good. It's two parts. The first part is an in-depth interview with Patrick from greenhouseinfo.com. Greenhouseinfo.com is a whole website dedicated to greenhouses and how to install them. And Patrick is a greenhouse expert. He gives us a great how-to guide on everything we need to know when installing a greenhouse, all the different styles of greenhouses. He's amazing. And then part two is very unique to Bloom and Grow. I reached out to four people who I know have amazing greenhouse setups. But what's really cool is these four individuals all have really different 
scales of greenhouses. So one of them has a small kit installed in her house, like an indoor greenhouse. And then another one has a fully custom DIY greenhouse with repurposed wood and vintage windows. But every greenhouse that you're going to hear from today with these amazing plant people is super unique. And I have a feeling that if you're inspired, you're going to have a muse from one of these five people we talked to today. They're seriously inspiration for everyone. So sit back, plant friends, relax, and enjoy this informative and inspirational episode. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster, plant friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio, Patrick. Thanks. It's great to be here. You are the answer to my prayers. I've been racking my brain to figure out who I should interview for this episode. And shout out to Tony, a member of the Garden Society, sent me your website. And I was like, oh my gosh, Patrick is the answer to our community's prayers. <laughs> wow, I'm really grateful to Tony for thinking of me then. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Tony. Yeah, she's a big fan. So, you know, you see more and more people having their own greenhouses, whether they're inside or outside, but there's so many things to take into consideration before installing one. I'm so excited to talk to you about all the nitty gritty. But before we dive into everything we need to know about greenhouses, I'd love to get to know you a little bit better. So can you tell us how you became the plant dad you are today? Sure. Yeah. I think that my trajectory to becoming plant obsessed is, is not very unusual. I, well, when I was a kid, I was really into animals. Like I think everyone is. And then I got to college and I was still into animals, but my biology degree required me to take this botany class. And I didn't go in expecting very much because plants are boring, but it, I had this fantastic professor and she just opened my eyes to how fascinating plants were in comparison to animals. Like you don't really think of plants as having behaviors, but they absolutely do. And it just takes place on a scale that's really difficult for us to perceive. So after taking that botany class, I got like really into plants and I, you know, went to Home Depot and bought 10 succulents the next day and they all died, of course. Of course. Yeah. As, as everyone's do. I have dead succulents in my plant a graveyard as well. <laughs> of course. But that really got me going. And and I that summer I was really bored. And I I was like, I'm gonna start a blog for the memes, I guess. And uh the blog really took off. I kept doing it because it was fun. Uh it was a good way to chronicle my learning. And and we're, I'm still working on that blog today. It's kind of turned into this whole thing. I've done been doing plants for my career for quite a while now. Yeah, it was uh completely unexpected, but I'm very grateful that that plants are now a big part of my life. And you're a multifaceted plant dad because the first blog you started was not greenhouse info, which is what we're talking about today. It was a succulent blog. Yeah. So how many different blogs do you have? Yeah, I have a few blogs. I've got this, this greenhouse info.com. I have sublime succulents.com, which was my first one. Uh, and definitely like my baby. Uh, and then I kind of have this third one, which is self-sustaining ecosystem.com. And it's almost like a marriage between the two because it's it describes, I guess, keeping plants and sometimes animals in like terrariums or aquariums, other kinds of ariums. 
we're having an episode. It, it won't have aired by the time that your episode airs, but in a few episodes, we're going to have a really cool deep dive on terrarium versus vivarium versus paludarium and all of the details of that. So totally paludariums are my personal favorite. I, I just love the opportunity to play with like semi-aquatic plants, which is, is so rare in other places. Yeah. And sweet listeners, you will, you will learn the difference of all of those words in a couple of weeks on, on our next episode, but the paludarium is basically a living self-sustaining environment that has a pond with, you know, fish, aquatic plants and terrestrial plants as well. Yeah, exactly. It comes from the Latin word palud, which just means swamp. So any arium with land and water in it. Love it. But today we're talking greenhouses. I'm so excited because I've been a bit of a traveler for the last year and a half. I've lived in furnished apartments for the last almost two years now. And Billy, my husband and I have just been visualizing our our house that we're going to buy soon. And the first thing that I want to do is install a greenhouse. So I'm your perfect, your target market right now, as is many of our listener communities. I think as our plant collections have grown, many of us have looked around our homes and been like, Hmm, I should find a place to put these all together (laughs) and not have every surface of my living room be covered in them. And there are so many beautiful reasons to why people might install greenhouses. Do you have one of your own? I do. Currently, my personal greenhouse is a 12 by 12. uh, I think it's a Paul room. Yeah. And it's not actually on site for me. It's because I live in an apartment in Seattle currently, but I have a friend's house pretty nearby. And they let me set up a greenhouse there. Uh, And it's good because this is kind of my sanctuary since I've moved to Seattle and I no longer work in a commercial greenhouse. That's amazing. So is this your first greenhouse? Is this what inspired greenhouseinfo.com? Well, I would would say that uh, my work in the commercial greenhouse is what was what really got me going with greenhouseinfo.com. And it was pretty critical because there's, there's a wide gap in greenhouse uh, usage between like personal greenhouses and commercial greenhouses. And there's a lot of different factors that come into play. So having experienced both is, has been really useful for me in understanding better how greenhouses work and how to grow in them. Yeah. Yeah. They're so different. And it's really kind of a complicated, I mean, it's very simple, I guess, but also kind of complicated with what you need to know and and how you need to make sure air ventilation is happening and pest management and all these things that, you know, caring for plants in this enclosed structure is going to really differ from your home. So for someone like me who is interested in getting their first greenhouse and installing it on a personal level, not a commercial level, what do I need to be looking for? And what do I need to know when I start my journey of research? Yeah. So there's a handful of things that are pretty important to consider before you even begin like shopping for greenhouses. I'd say the biggest one that usually ends up not really being a big deal is licensing and permitting. Another one is is where you're going to put your greenhouse and how it will be oriented. In general, you you want to know before you pick a greenhouse, like what do you want to grow in it? When do you want to be growing in it? Because those will determine like how big your greenhouse is or where you locate it. Depending on the size of your greenhouse, you might have to consider putting in a foundation. And pain material is, is usually the final consideration, but it might not even be a choice depending on whether you're buying a kit or building it yourself. So let's go back. Licensing. Why would someone need to get a license for a personal greenhouse? Yeah. So in the United States, anyway, we have two authorities that you need to consider when you're building a greenhouse. There is the zoning regulations and we have building codes and you can find the information that you need. Almost always, you can just call your local city hall and they'll be able to tell you what's up. So greenhouses, they're typically considered an accessory building as far as permits are concerned which means that it's a building on your property that is permanent and has a foundation usually. And so then they are subject to to certain regulations. The level of government that you have to interact with for greenhouses is typically your local municipality, which means that there's no way for me to say broadly, like before you build a greenhouse, you need to fill out this form because every county and every city will have their own, like some don't consider greenhouses to be accessory buildings, some do. 
So you like, you really have to do your due diligence and call before you start. So the blanket statement can be before you build a greenhouse, call your local <laughs> government office. We can't tell you what form you need to fill out, but we can tell you that you can't just go build a greenhouse. You need to call someone and make sure it's okay to install it. And they'll tell you what you need to do. That is the general rule. But I guess the caveat is if you're doing like a small greenhouse or which probably more accurately called a cold frame uh, where you like don't need to set up a foundation or anything, usually like those kind of cheap kits that you get from Amazon or whatever that cost like $500 or less, those aren't really considered permanent structures because they don't have a foundation. And those are typically not regulated in any way. You can usually throw those wherever you want without anyone getting mad. Okay. It's just when you start pouring foundation, installing electricity, putting in ventilation, that's where you got to worry about it. Okay, cool. So first you had said licensing, then you had said orientation and gardening zones. So gardening zones, knowing where and what you're growing, because if you live in New York, like me, you're going to have a brutal winter where unless you have a full heater set up, there's no way that your plants are going to make it through. Whereas if you're growing in Texas, we have a wonderful member of our garden society, Dina, who has a gorgeous greenhouse that she, I think, grows in year round. I know she takes some of her plants out in the summer, but you know we all have such different zones. What do you mean with orientation? Yeah, well, that's a pretty easy one. The point of a greenhouse is to capture sunlight or, or rather the heat from the sunlight usually and, and maximize the exposure your plants get. The best way to do this in the Northern hemisphere, well, in both hemispheres, is to align like the spine of your greenhouse, the roof going east to west. That will ensure that you get the maximum amount of sun both in the winter and in the summer because the sun will, you know, kind of veer about in its uh, relative position to the earth. And uh, in the winter, you get a lot more sun from the south, which is important. And this is reversed if you're in the other hemisphere, uh, not the north one. Shout out to our listeners for, in Australia. We love you. Sorry, everything <laughs> exactly. is flipped upside down for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure to anchor your greenhouses really tight so they don't fall off the planet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. East to West on the spine is important so that you have maximum sun on your North and South, like your longest part of your greenhouse. Okay. And then you mentioned, now this is the thing that I'm the most curious about the painting material, because, you know, I've been playing around with getting one of those mini indoor little greenhouses to set up in my office that you put a grow light in that almost looks like flimsy plastic. It looks like almost cellophane. And then you see these amazing greenhouses with reclaimed window panes. You see plastic ones, stained glass, um, but then you see plastic ones, then you see true glass ones. So what are the pros and cons of all of those different types of panes as we are trying to assess what the best choice for our specific space would be? There are a handful of different materials that greenhouses are made out of. Glass is the obvious one. Uh, glass is classic. It's expensive. It's fragile. It's not a great insulator in general. And insulation is really important for greenhouses, especially if you're in a northern climb. But glass is pretty great because it lasts forever, more or less, and it is super easy to maintain. So it's like a great long-term option for permanent greenhouses. Polycarbonate is probably the most common material used for greenhouse construction. It is strong and it's light, uh, much lighter than glass. It's pretty durable. I think on average, like a polycarbonate sheet will last 10 years or something before it starts to yellow or, or degrade. Obviously, if you're, if you're buying polycarbonate for purposes of, of putting on a greenhouse, you'll want to make sure that you get like the UV resistant kind. Otherwise it'll turn yellow really quickly. Mm, okay. That'll be ugly, but I guess more importantly, it'll reduce the amount of light your plants get. Another common material is acrylic or, you know, has some brand names like plexiglass. It is not very dissimilar to polycarbonate. It's, it's pretty strong. It's pretty durable. Uh, it's fairly expensive. I think it's a bit heavier. Usually the big thing you have to know is that acrylic it expands and contracts with heat and cold more so than other materials. And so 
depending on like the thickness of your acrylic, you might need to have a special mounting solution to attach it to, to the greenhouse. So that's sort of like a, you probably won't go with acrylic unless you're, you're using a kit that was built for it. So the last like really common one is polyethylene. And this is another plastic that you're pretty familiar with, you know, hoop houses, which are just like the kind of round ones that they look like they have really flimsy plastic on them. Uh, like it looks like grocery bags basically is they don't look totally transparent, but they let through almost as much light as the other materials. However, they're typically meant to be used just for like one season. You can buy polyethylene in rolls and you just like roll it over your hoop house and then you're supposed to get rid of it at the end of the season. All of these materials come in single pane options or they come in like multi-pane options. And that's important for insulation. Like you will, might find like a double walled polycarbonate or something and it has air gaps inside to like drastically improve your insulation. And I would probably, if you were building your own greenhouse, I would not choose to buy any of these materials in rolls. I would just buy the, the panes or the sheets and, and use those. Hoop house is accepted. Okay. I have so many questions. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we're going to hear from different members of our community at the end of this episode. They all have very different greenhouse setups. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what's so appealing to me is East Nash Greenhouse has reclaimed window panes that they created a whole thing out of. But to me, that sounds so intimidating, like figuring, I think you have to be so DIY focused in order to do that. So I think my question is the DIY route versus the kit route. Cause I feel like you see kits and now with kits, I have members of my garden society who basically bought a kit and hired someone to basically just come install it. And they didn't have to do anything. That feels really, really nice to me. So what are the differences, pros and cons of going DIY versus kit? And I think probably for most people who are going to go the kit route, what your recommendations would be. I think that the the pros and cons for kit versus DIY are probably the same as they are for any other hobby. It is maybe cheaper to do DIY, although if it's your first greenhouse, you'll certainly maybe cheaper to do kit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> you're definitely gonna spend more money on mistakes, but that's okay. It's part of the process. And having instructions is is honestly really critical if you decide to read them, which is a mistake I only made once. The thing about DIY is it's it's sort of difficult to characterize because it could be anything. The greenhouses that are made out of reclaimed windows and doors and stuff are are gorgeous. They are, they have to be like so fun to sit in. I think that it definitely requires a higher level of of handyman skill. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have to know some carpentry before you get in into doing that. And since the we're talking about permanent structures and maybe ones that have electricity running through them. I would be reluctant to embark on a DIY project like that without like some like someone experienced helping me. There's an element of danger if you did it poorly. As far as kits go, they're they're pretty cheap, I guess, anywhere from $100 to $10,000. But I guess once you're buying a $10,000 kit, you probably won't be installing that yourself probably have the budget for the installation. Yeah. I gardened with a, with a friend this summer, an older friend, Melody, and she had a greenhouse raising party where she Whoa. ordered a kit online. She had all of her friends come. It was the sweetest thing. She like made a Facebook event for it. She had a greenhouse raising party. She ordered the kit to the house. All of her friends came over. They had a potluck wow. and these are all retirees, mind you. And we all brought a wrench. It was 95 degrees out. It was the middle of summer. And we put this DIY kit up in two hours and we followed the directions, made a few mistakes, but for the most part, assembled it. And it was really interesting. It was also a beautiful community experience. It was so nice to just watch all of her friends show up for yeah. her in that way. But yeah, the kits do make it easy. I mean, you get a box with everything in it and, you know, in a couple of hours, you've got a greenhouse. Yeah. And that I, yours sounds like a best case scenario. <laughs> I think that if we're talking about like slightly larger greenhouses where you need to consider foundations, suddenly DIY is a little bit less appealing because you might be digging, you know, six feet holes and that might require a backhoe. If you want to do any more advanced greenhouse stuff, such as like underground thermal batteries or underground drainage, it does get beyond the level of, of DIY or having your friends help. 
But as long as you're doing the smaller kits, six by eight kits, the uh, a barn raising party sounds like an excellent solution. And when it comes to kits, is there anything to be mindful of when buying one? I don't know if you want to recommend and endorse brands or not, or if you want to say, you know, for kits, you should go the polycarbonate route or anything like that. But for, for total newbies, is there anything that we should be mindful of when exploring kit options? I don't have any particular brand recommendations or specific kits that I am really in love with. I think that my favorite greenhouses have all been custom jobs, but I would say that for a beginner who's interested in a kit, it is a good option and it's a great way to get into the hobby. I would recommend that if you have the means, I would go a little bit bigger than you think that you want. Assuming you have space and and money and stuff, Because in my experience, you always get a greenhouse for like the plant collection that you have now, but greenhouses are just enabling your addiction. So you will inevitably end up with huge, like a huge surplus of plants as soon as you finish building your greenhouse. And you'll be like, well, I need another one. That's so funny. We've had a bunch of conversations about greenhouses in the Garden Society, which has inspired this episode. And Dina, this woman who has an amazing greenhouse setup in in Dallas, that was her biggest piece of advice to members is buy a bigger greenhouse than you think because she's already looking into installing her second greenhouse. And uh, that's interesting that you say the same thing. So you brought up flooring. What floor do you have in your greenhouse and how important is installing a floor? Because I've also seen some greenhouses, people actually garden directly into the ground under the greenhouse. Some go the raised bed route. So what do we have to take into consideration for that? The primary consideration of your greenhouse flooring is going to be drainage. If you have a big greenhouse, you might have a foundation underneath like a concrete slab or something. And in this case, you need to be sure that any water you pour in your greenhouse can get out of it. If you don't have a foundation, you still have the same consideration. It's just a lot easier to handle. I have in my greenhouse just concrete pavers on the ground. And in between is gravel and moss and stuff because we're in PNW. But I like this because it provides a flat surface. It's like, you know, easy to clean and walk on and it's stable. But since there's space in between the pavers, uh, there's room for water to infiltrate into the ground. So I don't really have to worry about water in in the house too much. If you want to do gardening on the ground, I'm not really a big fan of that. My preferred like usage of greenhouse space is vertical because greenhouses are tall. So why would you confine yourself to the ground? So either having, you know, plant benches at waist height ish or having shelves is pretty common too. I don't do a lot of gardening on the ground because I guess like you could garden directly in the ground, but at at that point, you don't really need a greenhouse for that. You could just use a cold frame, Mm -hmm. which is like, it's kind of what you were describing earlier, just like the little mini kind of plastic box that that keeps stuff warm. Yeah. I don't, I also don't do a lot of like terracotta pot gardening on the ground or like raised beds in the greenhouse. I do have a raised bed of compost, I guess, but yeah, I figure since I want to separate my plants from like the earth biosphere, like, because that's the point of being in a controlled environment is being able to control every variable, including the soil. Thank you to our episode sponsors, Territorial Seed Company and Espoma Organics. Skip the line this gardening season and let Territorial Seed Company deliver top of the line, healthy and hearty vegetable plants right to your door. Plus, they ship in plant-safe boxes and give a 100% guarantee that your plants arrive in good condition so it's worry-free. I've been talking about Territorial Seed Company and their new kitchen counter collection of vegetables specifically bred to grow and produce in small spaces with lower lighting. In addition to their container-friendly varieties of plants like their patio snack or cucumber, the little Napoli tomato, but I have also been kind of obsessing and eyeing their wider range of flower mixes because I have dreams of planting a wild flower meadow in my front yard this summer. I'm so excited about it. Since we're renting this year, I'm definitely going to be ordering their pre-grown plants because I can't start seeds indoors this year. But whatever you need for your gardening journey, whether it's seeds, plants, garden planters, or more, Territorial Seed can set you up for success when it comes to your 2022 garden. And they have an exclusive coupon code for Bloom and Grow Radio listeners for 10% off. So visit TerritorialSeed.com and use code GROW10 at checkout for 10% off. 
Plant Friends, we know I love Espoma Organic. They are a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. And Espoma is the perfect sponsor partner for Territorial Seed Company because they have all of the mixes and fertilizers that our plants need to set us up for success. So if you're prepping your garden this summer, Espoma has your back. You've got to try their Biotone Starter Plus. They call it their starter fertilizer, and you're supposed to add it to anything you're potting up and or getting in the ground. Um, You use it in your initial planting, and it has endo and ecto mycorrhizae that help with water uptake and help the plants establish faster. I've used it in my containers for the last couple of years. And then throughout the growing season, you can feed your plants with Espoma's wide variety of famous tones or fertilizers that are specifically formulated for whatever you're growing. So their most famous one is their holly tone, but they also have citrus tone, which we use on limey, tomato tone, which we used on my mom's tomatoes, rose tone, flower tone, and Melody used garden tone in her garden last summer when I gardened with her. To top it all off, they have a huge sustainability commitment with a 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to check out the Bloom & Grow Espoma Amazon storefront with a curated list of my favorites to order online. Got it. So do some sort of, you could be as rudimentary as pavers that you just plop right on top of the ground that have little, you know, drainage pathways, or you could go as far as to like do some sort of raised foundation that you put the greenhouse on. That's probably going to require calling your local municipality. Okay. And the idea is to create this controlled environment that doesn't have the ground as part of it. It is for me. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to separate the greenhouse from like the outside atmosphere as much as possible so we can control all the variables. Yeah. And probably less opportunity for pests and little mice. We started stuff in Melody's greenhouse. We didn't know how those mice kept getting in, but they ate like two rounds of zinnia flats that I had tried to start. Yeah. So, okay. What other materials do we need to know about for a starter greenhouse? We need the frame. We need the floor. We need the painting. People talk a lot about fans and ventilation and heat. So what other things are we going to need to be buying for our first greenhouse? Yeah. So I think that a lot of people forget that greenhouses are pretty reliant on ventilation to operate correctly. And maybe this is a good time actually to kind of classify some different types of greenhouses because ventilation is a key factor. A greenhouse would be defined as, you know, like a a controlled environmental room that has ventilation, one, and does not have heating. Those are like the two things that make a greenhouse a greenhouse. A hothouse is a greenhouse that has ventilation and heating. So most commercial greenhouses are actually hothouses. And you'll find that even in like the desert of Arizona, when people are doing commercial grow operations, they are still using hothouses, even though it's, it's hot in Arizona, just because the ability to very narrowly define your temperature is, is critical for like achieving really high productivity in plants. I mean, for home growers, not a huge deal. After we have greenhouses and hothouses, uh, another really common one is cold frames. And this is, I think a lot of people look at cold frames and call them greenhouses. I mean, because they look identical. The difference here is that cold frames don't have ventilation or heat. So pretty much every greenhouse that you buy that's less than three or $400 is really just a cold frame uh, because it doesn't have, it wasn't designed for ventilation, you know? And the purpose of a cold frame is, is just to extend the growing season by a few weeks in either direction, you know, start your plants early or get one more harvest out of your strawberries kind of thing. When you want to start growing plants through the winter is when you upgrade to a hothouse, which is heated. Those are the three types of greenhouses that are common. Cold frame, greenhouse, hothouse in order of, I guess, ascending heat. So if I'm in New York zone five, if I have a cold frame with no heat, basically I'm using it to start seeds and get my tomatoes going a little bit earlier and also harden off starts. How does the ventilation and heating work? So if I was to buy, can I buy a kit that comes with heating? Like, how does that work? (laughs) So so the first thing you need to do uh, for all of your 
greenhouse like air conditioning needs, you will want this number, which is the total volume of your greenhouse. And I guess what's the formula? It's length times width times height is volume. Assuming your greenhouse is a cube, but it's probably not. It's probably, a, what is that? A gable shape when it's got the, yeah. And I think that then the formula becomes, like you can kind of get a rough estimate if you do length times width times one half of the height. And that sort of accounts for, you know, the volume that isn't really there. And this will give you how many cubic feet of air are in your house, in your greenhouse. And this is a pretty important number because you're going to reference it whenever you're looking at ventilation or heating. Rule of thumb for ventilation. You want to try to cycle all of the air in your greenhouse in one minute. Okay. So if you have, I guess, a, a 10 by 10 by 10 greenhouse, which is a perfect cube for some reason, and that means it has 100, 100 cubic feet of air. No, that means it has a thousand. A thousand, right? There. Yeah. there we go. So then you need to find a, a fan or an exhaust fan that is rated to push 1,000 cubic feet of air per minute. Um, and I think that the, the unit is CFM, cubic feet per minute. So there are a couple types of, of fans for greenhouses. There's just like a shop fan or a desk fan. And those work uh, for pushing air around, which is a helpful exercise, although it's not the most effective way to cool a greenhouse. An exhaust fan is, is one that's set into the walls of your greenhouse and it moves air from inside to outside and vice versa. Usually they come in pairs so that you can put one on one side of the greenhouse and one on the other, and you just move air from the inside to the outside mm, okay. you know, all the way through. That's a really effective way of cycling your air quickly. There's other fans and ventilators that we can consider. Vents are a really common addition for greenhouses and many kits have vents built in or like ports for you to install an aftermarket vent. I think there are many different kinds of vents, but the best ones are, are solar vents. They just, they have like wax inside of them that expands and contracts when it gets warm and they automatically open and close with no electricity, which Oh, that's light. cool. So they just go when the wax heats up, they open. Yep. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, although they can sometimes get stuck or need replacement, but it's a very nice, like low maintenance solution for events. I would highly recommend them. the kits that you buy will probably not have any ventilation built in unless it's like a really nice kit and might come with its own vents and stuff. You will have to add your own fans almost always. Okay. And, and I think that fans are a necessity for a greenhouse to, in order to control the, the humidity, especially in the mm -hmm. temperature, I would definitely bake that into the cost of building a greenhouse. Cause it's, it's a necessary component. Because you're running the fans with the greenhouse door closed to get that circulation moving. So that humidity, I asked listeners what big questions they had for you. And almost every question revolved around rot and ventilation, because I guess that's something that when a lot of people buy these kits or I guess cold frames, they're not taking in that into consideration. And they basically have plants sitting in these hot, humid greenhouses with no ventilation with the door closed and the plants are miserable. Mm -hmm. Greenhouses are like supremely effective at their job. They can raise the temperature anywhere from like five degrees Fahrenheit to, to 25, 30 degrees Fahrenheit greater than the ambient temperature, depending on how well they're insulated. So you could very easily cook your plants if you don't have proper ventilation. Yeah. And when it comes to electricity, can you buy kits that come with electricity hookups and you run a extender from your house or that's really more of a custom job? That seems like it probably exists. I'm not aware of any like that because I think that greenhouses tend to not have electricity involved when you buy a kit just for simplicity's sake. And, you know, for compliance reasons, most of the like when you want to run electricity to your greenhouse, for example, it's kind of like an either or like either you're going to just run an extension cord from your house because you only need to do this, you know, like maybe run a heater over the winter or something, or you're going to pay to have a contractor come and run power to your greenhouse, which is a whole other thing, which will probably also require you to get the city involved for permits. So unfortunately, there's not a good in-between. 
like it would be nice if your greenhouse could be self-sustaining from an electricity standpoint. Solar panels are a really common question. And to be honest, as much as I love renewable energy, uh, they're not a great solution for greenhouses, mostly because they're competing with the primary resource that your plants want, which is light. Oh, because the panel is blocking the light for the greenhouse. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could totally have a, a solar panel farm like on your house that's powering your greenhouse or something that works, but there's no good place to put a solar panel on a greenhouse, unfortunately. Very interesting. Okay. So those are some good options though. Electrify at your own risk. If you're running the, uh, the extension cord, that's what Melody had. She had a space heater and an extension cord and a prayer and, you know, it worked out great. <laughs> that's good. Um, worked out great. So let's talk about price and size a little bit. What would you say for a beginner is like the minimum that I should plan on spending on a greenhouse that's actually going to do its job and not be a waste of money? So I like to kind of frame all of these these queries using the really standard generic six by eight, you know, Paul room greenhouse. That's like kind of the cheapest starter greenhouse you can get. They're solid. Uh, I have no real criticisms of them. That uh, like a, a small six by eight Paul room is going to run you like five or $600 new probably. I think that it's, it's pretty easy to find used greenhouses on Craigslist or whatever, Facebook marketplace. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people get uh, like buyer's remorse or like their significant other isn't too into it or, you know, if they're moving and they don't want to leave it. So you can often find like the smaller greenhouses, like the six by eights and the eight by eights for used. And you could save a ton of money that way. And when you consider the, uh, the extra stuff you'll need to buy, like fans and, and heaters, maybe it'll probably end up costing you around a thousand dollars. That's a good estimate for like a very entry level greenhouse that will satisfy, you know, basic requirements. Mm -hmm. And then after that, greenhouses get pretty crazy. Like they totally run the gamut of anything from really cheap to like ludicrously expensive. There are surprisingly like tons of boutique greenhouse manufacturers out there. So you can get really, really cool stuff. Like these old Victorian conservatory greenhouses, which are my absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. And those like that costs 20 grand, you know? Because essentially it's almost like you're paying someone to build you a tiny house. Yeah, that is absolutely what it is. And it's kind of very similar with tiny houses. It's like on a smaller scale, like, a, you know, the cheapest tiny house is going to be around 10K, but mm -hmm. you could spend easily 100K on a tiny house, which then is like, okay, but then why are you building a tiny house for $100,000? But there was a period in my life when I was obsessed with the idea of having a tiny house. I have since, once I collected plants, I had, I've gotten over that idea, but yeah, I guess it sounds very similar because you could have a greenhouse install that has an interesting shape, ventilation, electricity, a nice stone floor. Like you could really trick it out if you wanted to. And especially since there's no real upper limit on the size of a greenhouse. So they kind of just keep expanding infinitely in terms of cost and dimensions. I think that if we're talking, if we're limiting our talk to, you know, home growers or hobbyists, there's not really any, like the high end for a, for a home greenhouse is about 10 grand. And that will get you like one of these nice sort of Victorian looking conservatory with multiple chambers, you know, which is awesome if you want to separate your collection into succulents versus tropicals or stuff like that. But yeah, I think that anywhere between a hundred dollars for a, a used cold frame to $10,000 for a brand new Victorian conservatory. Freaking wild. Any other common troubleshooting questions, you know, big, big mistakes you see newbies make that you want to maybe save, save us from? Yeah, I probably want to, clear up this common misconception that the greenhouses are a natural step in the evolution of gardening or that it's like a necessary step for improving your gardening. I, that's really not the case. It's kind of a whole other category. And if you think that just growing in a greenhouse will make your plants ha healthier and happier alone, it's you're going to be disappointed because a greenhouse is just a different environment. Uh, it's one that you control, 
So you can determine what the humidity and the temperature and the light levels and the water and the soil, everything. So you can really dial in these parameters to optimize growth, but it's not just a golden ticket to happy plants. There's a learning curve to growing in a greenhouse. You still have to kind of battle some of the same common issues, like keeping different plants and to have different needs in the same environment. And pest management is a whole nother thing in greenhouses as well. It is, but I will say that I like greenhouses because it gives me enough space to have a dedicated quarantine zone, which I think is a really important step for people that are like, I guess, like advancing in their gardening experience because I've lost so many plants because someone will be like, oh, I thought of you and bought this cactus. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And I put it on my shelf. And then two weeks later, my whole collection has mealybugs. My whole collection has scale. And it's just Oh, it's such a pain to deal with that. But <laughs> when, you have, when you have a greenhouse, I just have this one shelf that is over in the corner with like all the supplies. So it's like far away from all my other plants. Any new plant that I get gets thrown on this quarantine shelf with a sticky note that says like when I put it there and then I'll keep an eye on it for a month. And if it looks good, then I will move it so it can join the rest of the plants in the greenhouse. Um, And that has saved a lot of headache. That's amazing. Do you use predatory insects in your greenhouse? I don't in in my personal one right now, but I have used them in the past and they're really effective. Like ladybugs are a good one. Uh, You can do praying mantises too, lace wings. Lace wings, I've heard a lot of people do. There's this other one that's specifically good for tackling scale and it has a funny name and I can't remember it. It's like super something. Uh, We'll put the name in the show notes. <laughs> Great. Live pest control is really effective. And I try to stay like organic, you know, I don't want it. I'd never use any systemic pesticides on my plants because mm-hmm. I live on the Puget Sound and I'm concerned about, you know, that stuff leaching out. I also try not to use like harsh fertilizers. I'm pretty sparing on fertilizer in general, or I'll use like seaweed based stuff or compost worm castings, but having live Pest control makes it so that you don't have to use harsh chemicals, which is a big plus in my book. Yeah. And is there any other troubleshooting for managing humidity and like rot and mold and stuff in a greenhouse besides ventilation? I mean, ventilation is your number one defense against humidity. I think that there are some other tricks that you can use if you're dealing with root rot. I guess having airflow underneath your pots is is kind of a, a hidden secret. You might have noticed that some greenhouses have plant benches, but the bottom of the bench is actually like a grate or like metal grate so the air and water can freely flow through. And that's pretty important because it means that air gets over, assuming you have holes in the bottom of your pot, which you probably should, like air gets to the roots as well, which is where plants take in most of their air, but also that dries out the pot a lot faster, which will help prevent mold and and root rot. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's really interesting. And then what's like the ideal, I guess it depends on what you're growing, but where, what's the ideal temperature and humidity you're trying to keep greenhouses at? Like you said, pretty dependent on what you're growing. If I'm being really honest, I keep it at whatever is comfortable for me. (laughs) Uh, The plants don't complain very vocally. So, but I do. So it's warm, obviously. I think like a good place for a greenhouse to be is is probably around 80 or 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which might be toasty, but if it's not humid in there, it'll be a lot more bearable. And I try to keep out as much humidity as possible in general. If I were growing like a lot of tropicals in my greenhouse, I wouldn't, but tropicals are indoors. Everything else is in the greenhouse. So yeah, I just do low humidity. Okay, cool. And if uh, listeners, if any of our plant friends are interested in a deeper dive on regulating humidity, we have a lecture in the Garden Society that breaks down absolute versus relative humidity. And actually our horticulturist and residents gives like equations to figure out how to tinker with it in a greenhouse if you really want to nerd out. So if you want to take it to the next level. So any advice, any parting advice, this has been so informative, any parting advice for us beginner greenhouse, aspiring greenhouse people? Yeah, this one might be a bit of a Debbie Downer, but I would say think carefully about getting a greenhouse because it's, I mean, it's a big investment, both in terms of like money and time, but also space. And if you're not in a place in your life 
where you expect to be there for a while, then a greenhouse probably isn't the move. You can totally tide yourself over with a cold frame or, or something a bit smaller, like a, even a grow tent. But, but greenhouses are they're like kind of like pets, like they're commitments, at least a 10-year commitment, unless you have a way to transport it. And I think, and selfishly, one of the reasons that I say that is because all of the best greenhouses I've ever been to are ones that the plants have taken over. When you let the plants like grow up into the rafters and like wind their way around the support beams, it totally transforms the space. And that is the, the ultimate greenhouse experience. That's what I'm going for. And you really know, I mean, you really know what you're talking about. Your website, Greenhouse Info, is so informative. You have so many interesting photos of different greenhouses, all sorts of deep dives on what you need to know about different specific setups and kits. So where can everybody learn more from you if they are ready to start their greenhouse journey? Yeah, like you said, my website, greenhouseinfo.com, is probably the best resource. And if you want to talk to me directly, you can reach out through email at Patrick at greenhouseinfo.com. I don't do too much social media, so that'd probably be the best way to find me. Good for you. I'm jealous. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. This was so informative. Absolutely. I had a great time chatting with you, Maria. You too. Okay, plant friends, here's part two of this episode. Now we're going to hear from four real plant people who have set up greenhouses that work for their unique environments. I reached out to these greenhouse titans asking if they'd share what their greenhouses look like, how they set them up, and their advice that they have for beginner greenhouse adventurers like us. And like I said in the intro, the cool thing about these four people is they all have drastically different greenhouses, whether you're looking for an indoor setup, a simple renter-friendly outdoor garden kit, or if you want to go with a fully custom DIY setup, we've got all the insights for you. First up is a Bloom and Grow Garden Party member, Amy LeFavor. Amy is a plant enthusiast who loves to challenge herself by growing tropical plants in her cold home state of Massachusetts, where they're not used to being grown. Her story is amazing for people who are currently renting and looking for a low budget entry to experimenting with greenhouses that don't break the budget. We are apartment dwellers and luckily have a large sunny deck, but also live in zone six, so winter growing requires a greenhouse. We set up a lean-to, walk-in, temporary greenhouse, the kind that uses poles and has a soft zipper cover. On its own, it won't hold nearly enough heat, so we added a second layer of translucent plastic for more thermal protection. We used a few freight shipping pallet covers cut up and taped together to fit over the greenhouse because we already had some on hand. Not being able to stake the greenhouse to the ground or screw into the deck, we decided the best way to secure the greenhouse would be with weight. We created six large weights using empty kitty litter canisters, some filled with cement and some filled with beach stones. We tied four of them to the frame inside the structure and another two were outside with ropes running up and over the top and secured to the railing on the other side. We live a block and a half from the coast, so wind is a real concern for us. For air circulation, we have a couple of muffin fans that run constantly. During the coldest parts of the winter, we add a little heat using incandescent crisp twinkle lights, plastic sheeting over the plants inside, and during a particularly cold freeze, the bottom portion of my food dehydrator from the light 90s. We use the greenhouse to grow lettuce, kale, bok choy, and over winter, a few not-so-hardy perennials. Given our limited space, a winter-only greenhouse is our best option, and we take it down once spring really sets in. We definitely have ambitious permanent greenhouse plans once we do own our own home, but for now, our temporary greenhouse will have to do. Our first tip for prospective greenhouse owners would be to think creatively. Our cold season greenhouse setup is very budget friendly and part of that was finding creative ways to make it work for us. If we made it work, you can make it work. It is also a good way to see if greenhouse gardening is really for you before spending a larger sum of money on a much more robust greenhouse. Our second tip is that I would highly recommend a remote thermometer for your greenhouse. It makes monitoring the temperature much easier, especially when dealing with snow and freezing outdoor temperatures. 
My third and final tip is to have fun and experiment. You don't know what will work and won't work until you try. Thank you, Amy, for sharing. I love how approachable and easy this setup sounds. I love that Amy made it work for her, and I can't wait to see what her full-time real-life greenhouse setup will be when they move and own property. Next up is a darling of Bloom and Grow Radio. You might remember Tiffany from Plant Mama from an old episode we did on plant care routines. I knew I needed to feature Tiffany on this episode about greenhouses because she has a very interesting indoor greenhouse setup. She set up her greenhouse in her apartment. And in her audio that I'm about to share, she gives great tips for how she set it up. So without further ado, here's Tiffany. So I built my indoor greenhouse in 2020. This was one of the first winters that I was going through with my huge collection of tropical house plants. The previous winter, I had lost a lot of plants due to living in Ontario, Canada, where the climate is definitely not ideal for our tropical house plants. So I really wanted to build a greenhouse in order to mimic these tropical conditions that um, a lot of our house plants are native to. And basically, I just wanted to trick my plants into thinking the Canadian winter does not exist. And to just give you a better idea of the at home ambient conditions that I was dealing with in the winter. So it would be about like 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, for my American friends out there, that's about 65 Fahrenheit and maybe, maybe 20% relative humidity during the winter. So it was bone dry. So it was definitely important to me to build a greenhouse in order to house my tropical house plants, but also to keep them alive during the winter. So now with my greenhouse setup, I'm able to maintain like temperatures higher than 25 degrees Celsius, so higher than 77 Fahrenheit. And now my relative humidity fluctuates between 50 to 90 plus percent, which is fantastic for a lot of my aeroids. So in terms of my setup, it's not the fanciest, but it works. (laughs) So since my greenhouse is indoors, I didn't have to do anything to stabilize it or anything to the foundation. I literally just put down a tablecloth so that it didn't damage my ceramic tiles. I have the greenhouse on top of it. It is like a three-tier greenhouse that someone as short as me can stand comfortably in, but anyone who's taller than 5'2 may have to crouch in there. But it's able to house many, many houseplants. My collection of over 200 is in there, nice and snug, but it's in there. So in terms of materials that you'll need, In order to build your own indoor greenhouse, of course, A, you need the greenhouse. So you'll need fans for circulation, which is super important because whenever you have stagnant air around plants in a humid, hot environment, that's just a recipe for root rot, mold, and a bunch of other things. So we definitely want circulation in there. Um, Of course, we want grow lights. The ones that I use are full spectrum by Barina, and they're just held up by zip ties. And I also have a humidifier in there that I run at least once a day. So a tip that I want to share that could be applied to really anyone using grow lights or a humidifier or really any electronic, I plug all of these appliances into a smart plug bar. So with this bar, I'm able to connect it to my Bluetooth and using an app, I can set my grow lights to be on for 12 to 16 hours a day. I don't have to worry about remembering to turn it on or off. So it is definitely a great investment for plant parents. I think another thing that doesn't get spoken about much when setting up your own personal greenhouse is cable management. Now, this is key with things being humid and moist in the greenhouse. Like you just want to make sure that your cable management is um, proper out of the way. You don't want any type of electrical fires to happen. Safety is of utmost importance. So um, if there's any open outlets or plugs, like using electrical tape to really seal them off so that no moisture can get into it. So just making sure you take care of little things like that to make sure that you and your plants are both safe and happy. 
So now that it's been about three years since I've built my greenhouse, what's really exciting is that a lot of my collection, especially my Hoyas, have started trellising, self-trellising actually, on the um, structure of my greenhouse. So it's really turning into this jungle um, and I'm absolutely loving in there. And I love that I have this little greenhouse that I can call my own personal jungle. It's fun that I can... I'm able to replicate these conditions that my plants are native to and to see them thrive in an indoor environment that I built for it is just so rewarding. So anyone who's looking to build a greenhouse or thinking about it, like 100%, I recommend building your own greenhouse. You know, you don't have to get a walk-in greenhouse, even a smaller grow tent, like a three, four tier shelf would be perfect. But yeah, those are my tips and tricks that I would like to share about building your own personal greenhouse for your tropical plants. Thank you, Tiffany. I loved these tips that she gave. She also has such a beautiful voice to listen to. And if you're curious about hearing Tiffany describe her setup, she's kindly given us a video tour of her greenhouse that's on the Bloom and Grow YouTube show for you to enjoy. It's linked in the bio and her socials are also linked in the bio to go follow her. She is an amazing Canadian uh, plant consultant and she sells plants online in Canada. So if you're Canadian, go connect with Tiffany on the social medias. Next up, we have Kristen, who is an amazing plant lady of the channel Tending West. Kristen's greenhouse is so interesting because she took a normal standard DIY kit and elevated it to become the greenhouse of her dreams and feel like a DIY install. So this would be really interesting for anyone who is interested in installing a permanent greenhouse on their property without having to spend the crazy money. You'll definitely need time and someone super handy to do the things that Kristen mentions, but obviously it was worth it. Here's Kristen. Hello, my name is Kristen Guy. Uh, I am a certified horticulturist, a master gardener for the city of Los Angeles, and I write and take photographs for several home and garden publications as a way of educating people to learn to grow and thrive in their own gardens. Today, I'm going to talk about my greenhouse, and I have an 8x12 Palram kit uh, which are pretty easy, accessible, pretty affordable greenhouse kits. I think that it was a pretty good quality for the purchase price. And basically, we had the opportunity to build our garden from scratch. We purchased a home about six years ago and two years into figuring out how we wanted to develop this very blank slate. We had about 5,000 square feet of just dirt lot that I wanted to turn into my practice hobby garden, uh, experimental garden. And what an opportunity to do that because it was an absolute blank canvas. And I thought that not only adding a greenhouse would be a way for me to experiment and work on some horticultural, uh, you know, plant growing and expand the offerings that my garden could have by growing things from seed. And, and I just thought it was actually going to be this beautiful architectural design exclamation point in the back of our garden. Uh, and so we started with a few raised beds and then we built the the greenhouse in the back and we fully customized it. Uh, at the time, there were no black greenhouses on the market. And I'd like to think that we were one of the first ones that started the whole Pinterest craze. Uh, we actually powder coated each individual piece. And if you've uh, ever had the experience of putting together your own greenhouse kit, it comes in a lot, a lot of pieces. And thankfully, my husband took it as a challenge as a almost a Lego project of keeping things very organized while we assembled it. Uh, it took several weekends for us to finally complete it. But yeah, we uh, we powder coated each individual metal piece because when it arrived, uh, we thought it was going to be more of a hunter green. But in actuality, it was kind of this fluorescent, almost street sign reflective green. Uh, so we powder coated it a matte black. And that was the kickoff to this idea that we could completely customize it on a shoestring budget, actually, because so many of the greenhouse kit compartments, like the, the additional add-ons, can be so expensive. So the first thing we did is we uh, we powder coated it black. Uh, once it was built, we, we used some of the pre-bought 
shelf brackets. And for the amount of shelving that I wanted to do around both sides of the 8x12 structure, uh, it was going to be very expensive. So we actually used the uh, the, the pre-made shelving brackets as individual bracing points and ran four by six lumber across the top redwood uh, and were able to create two rows of custom full length shelving on both sides, which is where I grow all my seedlings and I have all my storage and bins. And it's been really great. Uh, Additionally, we uh, put in some IKEA floor decking, uh, which has proved to be a really great durable uh, floor cover and Uh, along with some pea gravel and some other components. I have a potting bench in there. It's kind of an evolving creative uh, uh, tool shed for me. It it, it really truly is a hardworking real greenhouse. It is is always something going on in there. And uh, it is where I store my tools. It is where I store my equipment and is where I truly start and care for all my seedlings. Uh, I will say if you're going to be purchasing and getting into your own greenhouse, be prepared. Uh, It is a lot of work to put it together. You have to have patience and you have to just carve out little bits of time. Don't feel like you have to accomplish it all in just one weekend because it is going to take a little bit of time of getting things organized and built. I think the most important thing to consider is making sure that your foundation is flat. We actually dug down and created a cinder block foundation. We have a slightly rolling uh, hillside property, so we wanted to really make sure that when the greenhouse was built that it was stable and secure. So it is sitting on a cinder block foundation and it is situated in partial shade. And that is for a reason. I live in Southern California. Uh, There's great bright and direct light in there. It's been really great for starting seeds. But if you are in a climate where there are warmer summer months, be prepared that it is in not inhabitable, but it is absolutely just almost, you know, like the the surface of the sun in certain months. There are about three, two and a half, three months of the year that I do not go in there. Uh, we have a thermometer in there. It, it tops, it, it gets almost 130 in there on some days. So just be warned that it is, if depending on your climate, Temperature control might be an issue, uh, but just knowing that and knowing the seasons that I can grow in there are really exciting, and it gives me a lot of opportunity to even grow certain things during parts of the year that you wouldn't normally. Uh, I can have experiments in there. It's been really a creative extension of my gardening plan. Thank you for sharing, Kristen. We've got photos of her greenhouse in the blog and show notes of today's episode. Go check her out on Tending West on socials. Also, if you're really curious about exactly how Kristen built her greenhouse after being inspired by this audio, we have a link to a blog on Domino Magazine where Kristen broke down the steps and shared photos if you're curious. So check it out. Last but not least, we have Eric from East Nash Greenhouse. Plant friends, this is the greenhouse that you have probably pinned already on Pinterest. This is the most photo-worthy, Instagrammable, unbelievable greenhouse. (laughs) I've been following East Nash Greenhouse on Instagram for a while now because I'm just obsessed with the space that they've created, and I knew that I wanted to ask them to participate in this episode. So this is definitely the most labor-intensive, the most time-intensive, the most cost-intensive greenhouse that we're featuring, but man, it's so amazing and so cool that Eric and his family enjoy it and also have opened up to their community. So I hope you enjoy Eric's story. Hi, this is Eric with East Nash Greenhouse. I wanted to tell you all a little bit about our greenhouse today. So we're located in Nashville, Tennessee, and we have a small 120 square foot greenhouse in our in our backyard. It's all made out of vintage and upcycled materials and windows. And it is home to around 300 uh, different varieties of houseplants. The story of how East Nash Greenhouse uh, came to be actually goes back four or five years when my wife and I were living in San Francisco. In our apartment there, we had around 75 houseplants, our daughter, our dog, and uh, we were all just crammed into about 600 square feet. And so in, in my mind, whenever we upgraded to a bigger space, I really wanted a plant room of some some sort. Wanted a space where uh, we could just have tropical vibes all year round. That was our apartment. I just wanted more more of that. So when we got relocated to Nashville, Tennessee, 
in our mind as we were touring houses, I, I really wanted that. I wanted either a plant room or ideally a greenhouse. And we ended up touring this 100-year-old house in East Nashville, and it had this falling down garage in the backyard. And in my mind, I was like, yes, that is, that is the greenhouse. And so we knocked down the garage and we, we worked with the Historic Association in East Nashville to build something that was a greenhouse that was kind of the same, same shape as, as the garage that preceded it. We collected um, windows from a bunch of homes in the neighborhood. I think it was four or five homes overall of people that were renovating and getting rid of their, their old windows. And uh, through the process of collecting it, we, we started building kind of wall by wall. We would uh, get 10 recycled windows and put together a frame for, for one wall. And then we'd get another 10 to 15 windows and we'd put together another wall. And over time, we, we built this, uh, I, I think, pretty awesome space. It started out just as a indoor outdoor living space for us as a family to use, uh, whether it's having dance parties or drinking wine with friends, just a, a cool space to come together and, and relax. Over time, we, we started the Instagram account about two years ago for the greenhouse and, um, a bunch of people got really interested in the space and, uh, and doing it. And we, we started decided to share it. So we, we now rent it out for photo shoots. Um, we've had a bunch of music videos um, filmed here. Nashville, obviously, is is Music City. And uh, we've even had uh, a few weddings hosted at the greenhouse, which has been super, super fun. What I would say for someone that doesn't have a greenhouse today that's thinking about getting it is figure out first what you want to use it for and think about where you are. And so if you're not familiar with gardening zones, gardening zones are kind of dictate what plants you can grow where. Obviously, with the greenhouse, it, it enables you to grow a lot more stuff year-round, but it also uh, highlights how cold it gets in the winter. So here in Nashville, we're in zone 7A, um, which means that it drops down into the teens in Fahrenheit in, in the winter. And so we needed a space that could hold 40 to 50 degrees above that minimum temperature in the winter. And because we want a tropical greenhouse, it meant that we were going to heat it all year round. And so I would say start with what you want to use it for. If you want it to be tropical and year round, um, figure out how big you want it, how much heat you actually need. There's great greenhouse um, heating calculators online. And then think about your materials. If you're in colder weather, you might need more insulated materials than us here in Nashville. If you're in California or Arizona, you probably don't need as great of insulation or, or even heating. You might want to think about ventilation. But materials matter. You can buy cheap plastic greenhouses offline um, that might not stand up to wind and also, also might not uh, stand up to colder temperatures. Um, or you can upgrade a little bit and buy prefab or custom greenhouses from places like Hartley USA or um, Vanderbilt. Or you can go our route and start collecting a bunch of vintage windows and, and kind of construct it yourself. Lastly, what I'd say is you don't need a ton of building experience to do this. This was the first thing that I ever built. I'm super proud of it. I made a ton of mistakes along the way. But um, if you're interested in building your own greenhouse, just go out and do it. It's easier than you think and a lot more fun um, than you think as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eric. East Nash Greenhouse is also linked in the bio in case everybody wants to follow them for all the inspo. I'm so thankful to all four of these greenhouse owners to give their time and expertise to us. All of their social handles, websites, everything are linked in the show notes in case you want to go follow their greenhouse journeys for more inspo. We also have lots of photos of their greenhouse setups in the blog and show notes for this episode that will also be linked in case you want to check them out. Okay, plant friends, that's all for now. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed putting it together for you. I thought it was such a beautiful combination of informative and also community-driven. Like I said, if you're interested in doing a greenhouse, I can't recommend joining us in the Garden Society enough, the Bloom and Grow Garden Society, where college-level horticulture education and plant community come together with our exclusive app, we have in-depth lecture recordings from Leslie, our horticulturist in residence, on humidity management, transpiration, grow lights, plant nutrition. I mean, all the things that you'd really need to take a deeper dive in if you want to set up a greenhouse for success. We've got, I'm, I like calling it Netflix for plant care. 
you can also, you know, use Leslie's office hours to troubleshoot things as you set up your greenhouses. So I highly encourage you to join us for as cheap as a plant a month, or if you sign up annually, it's less than one plant science class that you would take at a university level. And last but not least, thank you so much to those of you who have pre-ordered Growing Joy, my first book. By now, you've heard, I'm sure, about Growing Joy, the first book. It's called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. It's a self-care book about plant care. It is my love letter to plants. Oh my God, plant friends, I can't wait to bring it to you. So thank you so much to those of you who have pre-ordered. I've heard from so many of you. And if you haven't pre-ordered yet, gentle reminder, kind reminder, and request a pre-order because pre-orders make a huge difference to my publisher. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I deeply appreciate you. I am here to help this community grow, expand, connect. Lots of connection coming in the in the next couple of months. And man, we have so many good episodes lined up on Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm so excited about this season of content. So until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow Radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. 
No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. <music> 